This second panel is on um, data analytics in, in football. Uh, subtitle, uh, have the geeks inherited the turf? The mantra is, of the business is you don't um, necessarily have to outspend your rivals. You can kind of win by, by outthinking them. It's something that happens in almost every sport. How you apply it is, uh, is the interesting part. And uh, it's not just about having better information with everybody. It's about using it to, to take action. The long-term trend across all industries, all walks of life, um, all sports, is that uh, the geeks are inheriting the turf. If, if that means we're using more information, more evidence, more uh, yeah, ways of processing and using that information for the right decisions, um, that's sort of undeniable. That's not something you can dial back. That's not going to go away. The trend is clearly in that direction. We try and do is we take the data and we look for better players and uh, and try and profile the ones that fit the system, fit what the coach wants. Uh, that's fifty percent of my job. The other fifty percent, like twenty five percent research and twenty five percent team analytics. There's an old American say. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to translate it correctly because I don't speak the Queen's English. But um, if, if a bear develops IP in the woods <laughs> and uh, and no one actually uses it, does it even matter? I mean, this is a bear developing IP. It's pretty exciting, right? But, um, <laughs> in reality, it doesn't matter how much smart information you have sitting in front of you if no one takes action on it and if the decisions aren't smarter. So, like, we are always looking for learning experiences. If you were to show up with something and, and maybe we'd learn something out of it. Uh, on the other hand, hopefully we've done our homework and, uh, and we have a pretty good idea of what we value the player at and then there's negotiation. The three big areas are recruitment, finding players, keeping the right players, losing the right kinds of players. Um, so player recruitment and talent management, I suppose. Um, the second one is match analysis. How do we play? How do the opposition play? How do we gain an advantage? Uh, and then the third one is sort of fitness, sports science, medical injuries. You know, finding something football clubs is regarded, you know, it's, it's, it's a merger's not conditions transaction. And historically, I guess, there was a relatively kind of industry agnostic approach. If you're buying, um, you know, a widget factory, you're buying a football club that you would use the same advisors and it, 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 it might be perceived the issues with the same. And I think this would be a very interesting trend, uh, which has been, and it's not a one off. This is, you know, we, we, the previous, um, you know, Chris, um, previous current role was, was involved in, in, in doing similar work with, with investors and other clubs, and actually the last number of Premier League clubs, and also the underbidders on some of those deals are now using, you know, all using uh, data analytics um, uh, personnel as, as part of the due diligence team. So now there's three of us, there's the legal due diligence, the financial due diligence, and effectively the analytics due diligence. And, and when you say analytics due diligence, what that is, is it, it's, it's player due diligence, it's squad due diligence, and that makes a lot of sense because if you're buying a Premier League football team, um, you know, the, the purchase price you're paying, uh, there's a lot of that value tied up in the squad, and you need to understand um, the value that, you, that you're acquiring, um, you know, where the holes are, where the value is, what the resale value is, where, um, what their likely performance is in last year, what their real performance was, what's it, sorry, likely performance next year, what the real performance was, was last year, you know, where, where they look at you effectively. I mean, a, a lot of analytics is about, uh, in, in football, is, is, is looking at look. Um, yeah. and understanding the role that look plays in the game. And I think that's something that's actually a bigger threshold for people to understand analytics in football than it is in other sports, because goals are such freak outliers. Look has this huge, huge role in football, um, and it doesn't fit the media narrative, and it doesn't fit the fans' understanding. You know, we were doing some work in Norway a few weeks ago, and we calculated that the team who actually deserved to win the games last season in Norway actually earned uh, ended up only winning those games 59% of the time. Um, well, like I say, because luck is, it, it can, can be such a huge factor, which, again, going back to the investor context or a, a football club context, could mean that if you're an investor looking at a football club, um, the league table, contrary to popular belief, sometimes can actually lie. So you might think you're investing in a team that's, that's fifth in the table, when actually their underlying performance level is tenth in the table. Uh, which clearly has implications on potentially the valuation of the football club because you typically, like I say, tend, tend to get what you deserve in the long run. Again, luck and randomness in football, how we can get under the bonnet of just looking at the superficial result um, and, and goals and try and uh, understand performance a bit more for, for the benefit of sustainability. So to, there's the phrase, you create your own luck in football, right? Or just in any sport. And I don't necessarily believe that, but I do believe you create your own marginal gain. 
And the marginal gain part is the, the thing that, you know, that's where competitive edges are. So I think one thing analytics has done is it's not just improved teams' ability to win or in, in, in these other sports or in, changed the way teams evaluate players. It's actually fundamentally changed the way the sports are played. And I think that's really interesting. Can you measure heart? Can you measure weight from it? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where I'm disagreeing with you. Um, this is the one where I think we sit up. Um, so what we can measure, of course, so is, is we can measure, we don't just measure what you do. Of course we can measure what you do, but we don't know the intent behind it. Uh, what, 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 what psychologists, of course, can measure is things like perseverance, grit, teamwork, um, um, conscientiousness, all those kinds of wonderful things. And of course, um, they're all measurable, they're well validated, there's a whole long slew of science behind it. Um, so I, I'm disagreeing and I'm not disagreeing. I think what's, uh, those things are measurable, we don't currently measure them. Football clubs don't measure them. Uh, or don't measure them very well at all. I, I agree with Chris. Like I think we could be so much smarter about so many things, and this is why you kind of you have to have those voices in the room. And and we need to, you know, we, we need to measure mental load, like a, a bit like we measure physical load. Um, and there are all these studies that are coming out that are the sleep studies, where not only are the people sprint um, sprints going up, but their cognitive abilities. So now American sports are looking at super sleeping. How are you sleeping? And it's not just that, it's the willpower research that says that, you know, the better willpower you have, the more likely you are to eat healthy versus uh, versus choosing the, the pot of Ben and Jerry's or whatever. And, and it goes all the way through, like, humans are a holistic system, and, and this stuff will come out in some of the data, but there are other ways to measure it that are not directly, you know, stats-based, but are more of the, the, the human sciences-based that we could probably do a lot better with, and we probably will in, in the future. Um, the the great innovators in the game typically have been managers. And what, what do they have in common? They're curious. These great innovators are curious, open-minded people with a passion for winning. And winning maybe in a different way. And the willingness to engage with something they don't know something about, like technology or sports science, whatever it might be. And if you've got managers who are completely close-minded about these kinds of things, they're probably the wrong guy or the wrong gal. And they might be a great fit for something else. Um, so to me, that's a really interesting kind of dividing line.